Thank you so much. And we go on to our next speaker, Charlotte Korshak. Charlotte, are you there? I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlotte. The floor is yours. All right. Well, hi, everyone. I wish I could say good evening. I haven't really been able to say that for 10 days now. Um, so what I want to do is I want to really, we just heard tools of what we can do online. And what I want to do is really give us the facts. That is the most important thing. We were just talking about fake news and accuracy. And the key is always making sure that we have the most updated and accurate information that we're putting out there. And so I want to talk specifically about the facts and the content that we should be putting out there as opposed to the how to, which is what we just got. This is now going to be the actual content itself. So first of all, I just want to give a very quick kind of update on where we are now, 10 days now into this war. So obviously, I'm, I don't want to tell you all things that you already know. So let's stick with information that would be new information. We all know what happened on October 7th. Uh, we were invaded by land, air, and sea from Hamas. And in the process of this invasion, Hamas managed to kill, murder over 1,300 Israelis. They managed to injure over 4,000, nearly 4,000 Israelis, uh, 300 of them still at this moment hospitalized, some still in critical condition. We also have suffered over 6,500 rockets. Uh, that number might have jumped up to 7,000 7, today. Uh, that's something to keep an eye out on and definitely keep looking at Stand With Us's page. We keep putting out an infographic that has these numbers that are being continuously updated. We know that 199 hostages have now been taken. Um, we we got that number today. Um, so 199 hostages, all of their families have now been informed of their status, as far as we know, obviously. Um, and we should also point out that 17 of those killed or uh, kidnapped are British citizens themselves. Um, and that is definitely something that we need to talk about to make sure that people understand that this was more global than they think it was, as many, many foreign nationals uh, were either kidnapped or killed in this terrorist attack. Um, and that includes British citizens. Um, and obviously a member of the London community, Jake Marlowe, who was a good friend of many of my friends. So what's happening now? Uh, so those are the updated numbers. What's going on currently in Israel? So a few things. First of all, rockets are still raining down. Uh, we had rockets towards Jerusalem just recently. I, not going to lie, I slept through the rocket siren because I have not been sleeping normal hours. So I sleep in two hour incre in increments and I was asleep in the middle of the day. Um, we've been getting rockets obviously continuously from the north. They are still pounding many of the southern communities that they decimated uh, on October 7th. Uh, we we have now have rocket fire also from Hezbollah, and there's real concern that a second front, front might be opening up in the north. Obviously, again, we need to continue to emphasize that this is obviously Iran. These are both Iranian proxies, both Hezbollah and Hamas. And so Iran is really the puppet master of this whole reality. And so they and they also continue to warn as this is happening. They've warned now multiple times that if Israel remains inside and well continues to conduct the bombings that they are doing in Gaza, that they are going to interfere. So we've got the rocket fire. We've got the new front opening up possibly in Lebanon. We've also had rocket fire from Syria. Also, again, a proxy of Iran. And then tragically, of course, we are still continuing to bury our dead here in Israel. Um, there are still funerals going on um, as there are still casualties. It's something to note as well. We are getting new casualties from rocket fire and from anti-tank missile fire in the north, for example. And we're still getting the names of soldiers and others who have been killed um, in this ongoing war that we now find ourselves in. And lastly, that's it. Preparation for war. Uh, we already started a war and most of that has been bombing in Gaza from the air. We have done a few ground operations um, in Gaza, not full blown ground offensives, but we have sent forces into Gaza for specific raids of specific areas. And we did we did manage to actually get back bodies of hostages that had been taken into Gaza, as well as some very crucial intelligence information. So we have not fully gone into Gaza. We've done some raids. We are obviously bombing Gaza from the air which is, of course, allowing the world to now shift very quickly their focus, right, which we all kind of knew was going to happen. And I, I hate to say it, a week ago, I was talking about this. And of course, I said, give it a few days and the world will begin to turn. And they will definitely turn once the death toll in Gaza rises above the death toll in Israel. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, the death toll in Gaza is rising. Innocent people are being killed in Israeli bombings. Uh, 
I think we need to be very clear, though, about who is responsible for that. And that is Hamas. I, I don't understand how anyone sees it any other way. I also think when people challenge you on the numbers, I think we really have to hyper focus in on intentionality and why. What was the intention behind how these people in Gaza were killed versus how people in Israel were killed? The younger generation forgets about intention. They only consider impact, which is why TikTok and Instagram and social media and the use of essentially atrocity propaganda showing photos of young people children in Gaza being brought into a hospital, it pulls at your heartstring and it you, all you see is the impact. But very rarely does the younger generation ask, but what, what caused this, right? What was the intention? Did, were they targeted or was this an accident, right? That's it. That conversation very rarely happens. And that creates a very challenging reality for Israel because intention does matter. And we're not trying to kill innocent people. We're trying to weed out a terrorist organization that just committed the worst massacre against Jews since the Holocaust. So there's that as well um, that we need to consider. And again, I think when we do talk about this, the one thing we need to emphasize is the separation between Hamas and innocent Palestinians. They are not the same thing. And you have to be very careful if you're engaging with people on social media that you do not use the language of the Palestinians when you're talking about Hamas. If you do that, you will be blaming the victim, which you cannot do. It's not their fault. They are victims of Hamas, just like we are victims of Hamas. And so you have to be very, very clear. We are targeting Hamas, not innocent civilians. But now let's get into what Hamas is doing. So we've been bombing from the air. We've also partially, we basically put Gaza under siege. And that is the right terminology to use now, even though that has been a claim, a false claim made against Israel now for many years, which is also the irony of the anti-Zionists, right? They've been accusing us of a siege for the last 16 years. And now they're saying, Israel implemented a siege on Gaza. And I kind of look at them and say, haven't you been saying that there's been a siege on Gaza for the last 16 years? So what changed? And what changed was that in the blockade, Israel allowed humanitarian aid into Gaza. Always 30,000 tons of aid flowed into Gaza every single week through the Karen Shalom crossing here in Israel. The difference is that when we implemented this siege, we did cut off everything from going into the Gaza Strip. Now that has changed. Uh, there are now humanitarian corridors being created to allow uh, supplies to get to the south of Gaza. Why the south? Because of course we all know Israel ordered an evacuation of Northern Gaza on Friday. They gave a 24 hour notice to, for all people, innocent people in Northern Gaza to evacuate. That was 1.1 million people. And of course we heard the cries from the UN and the Red Cross, this is impossible, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Israel obviously knew that, or. And it's not actually true, but Israel took that into consideration, considering that now we are three days in to that 24 hour deadline and we still have yet to bomb in northern Gaza in any kind of significant manner. And so we are taking the innocent civilians into consideration. Lastly, there's been a claim out there that Israel bombed the evacuation routes, that we were telling people to evacuate, but then we were bombing the evacuation routes, essentially trying to say that we are propagandizing, that we're saying it, but we really aren't, we don't actually mean it. Now there is more and more evidence that's coming out that is showing that most likely the, the entity that bombed the evacuation route was actually Hamas. So, and for the purpose of scaring the Palestinians, making them think that it's Israel, so that they will run back to the north and that they can then be used as human shields by Hamas. You know, I have been talking about this conflict for now 15 years of my life uh, as, as uh, you know, in the field of activism and education. And we've talked about human shields really since the beginning that I've been discussing this issue. Um, and I think for the first time ever, we had a president of the United States actually use that terminology. Just in the last 48 hours, Biden said they are using their citizens as human shields. We need to keep pushing out that information. Look, innocent loss of life is tragic. I, I don't think there are very many Israelis walking around celebrating the fact that innocent Palestinians are being killed in Gaza while we're trying to weed out Hamas. Just the opposite happened, though, right, last week, where a, over a million, over a thousand innocent Israelis were murdered and there were celebrations on the streets of London. And this needs to be made clear to people that we're talking about that both are innocent people. And one, you are expressing such tremendous, just such tremendous compassion and empathy when when an attack happens against innocent civilians in Gaza when they're not even targeted and yet when it was so clear that innocent Israelis were targeted at a music festival or held just li literally sitting in their homes and you can't muster up an iota of compassion it's 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 very telling this is something we need to keep reminding people. And, you know, people have, have reached out to me online. I'm obviously very visible online, especially now. And I get spammed by anti-Israel, anti-Zionist haters. And they'll still just spam me with a bunch of photos from Gaza. And my first response to them is, 
if you could not start this conversation with me by expressing any kind of compassion or empathy for the 1300 family members that I just lost, I'm not sure that I need to be engaging in this conversation with you. If you want to start with that, and then we can talk about what's going on in Gaza by all means. But if you cannot understand the gravity, the unprecedented nature in our lifetime of what just happened in Israel, there is no reason for me to engage. And I have to tell you, I am somebody that has spent much of my life preaching what I call the 595 5% of people who are Zionists and they're going to be on your side. And right now we are remarkably united when we are usually not. There's a lot of disagreement within that camp, which is, by the way, I think beautiful the way that we disagree within the camp. But 5% of people who will always defend Israel's right to exist and usually Israel's right to defend itself. Then you have the 5% who are anti-Zionists. And then you have the 90% who's in the middle. And I very rarely put people in the category of the anti-Zionist. I think most people don't sit there. I think most people are misinformed or uninformed, which is that 90% in the middle. And I think it's always worth having a conversation with people, even when they start out appearing to be anti-Zionist. I don't know if I still feel that fully. I think now my line is, if you cannot express any kind of compassion, if it's, yeah, a bunch of Jews were killed, but... Yeah, a bunch of Jews were killed, but you deserved it. There's, I don't know if there's a reason for you to continue to engage with somebody like that. They have lost their their moral compass to a certain extent, or they they do not see Israelis as human anymore, or they see them as the power, and therefore they have no sympathy for what they perceive to be the power. So I want to now just re really quickly just wrap up with just some of those core claims. We deserve this. I think, first of all, if anyone says that to you, if anyone engages in the but- yeah, it's so unfortunate, but I think you need to respond and say, listen, most of the claims that you're making against Israel are false. We didn't, we haven't been raping and killing Palestinians for the last 70 years. That's simply not true. Even so, nobody deserved what we, what happened to us. Nobody. No babies deserve to be killed. The babies are responsible for the occupation. The babies are responsible for what Israel has done over the last 70 years, Right. No. And I think that needs to be clear without no apologies. I'm not here to apologize. I'm not apologizing for defending myself. I'm not apologizing for retaliating so that they can never do this to me again. There is nothing, nothing that anyone could have done that could have brought this upon us. You want to target somebody, target our military. If you think you have a legitimate reason, I would still argue that they don't have a legitimate reason, but that's a much bigger topic for another time. Okay. Four claims. Evacuations. Where can Gazans go? Israel literally gave them a map and told them exactly where to go. And they've done this in every operation. When they drop leaflets, they tell them where to go. There's safe zones in Gaza. There's war zones in Gaza. Right now, the entire south of Gaza has been declared a safe zone. The entire northern part of Gaza is a, is a war zone. They have somewhere to go. They need to go to the south. The tragedy of that is that Hamas is stopping them. Hamas is creating roadblocks, taking their car keys, not allowing it. These are messages that we have to put out there, which is also why Israel's not bombing yet. Because Israel's going to try to make sure that as many people can get to safety as possible before we initiate our bombing campaign. Humanitarian crisis in Gaza. There has been humanitarian crisis in Gaza, and it is nothing to do with Israel and the siege that Israel has placed on Gaza now. The humanitarian crisis in Gaza has been going on for 16 years due to complete and utter neglect by Hamas of the territory. They've spent 85% of their budget on terror and 15% on infrastructure. The territory has been falling apart. They didn't have a lot of electricity to begin with. They didn't have access to clean water because they illegally or in an unmonitored way were drilling illegally into their aquifer, which eventually caused contamination of their groundwater. So now they have to desalinate water and they have a desalinization plant in Gaza, but they need fuel to run that desalinization plant. And they have been using the fuel to run it, but right now Hamas is taking the fuel and Hamas is taking, and we now have reports that Hamas is also taking some of the, the humanitarian aid that's been sent into Gaza. You know, a friend of mine messaged me the other day saying, Charlotte, please, you know, tell them to open a humanitarian corridor. And first of all, I thought it was funny. I'm sitting there thinking, you think I have like a direct line to Bibi Netanyahu to tell him to open up a corridor, like as if I can do that. But second of all, I said, why? So we can send a bunch of, of food and water and medical supplies to Hamas? Do you understand who we're dealing with? We are under, we, they, they control the entire strip. We send the aid in. They put a gun to the head of the Red Cross person saying, give us the aid. And they give them the aid. So the idea that we're creating this humanitarian crisis in Gaza, no. This war that was brought upon us is creating a humanitarian crisis crisis that has already existed in Gaza because of a failure of leadership, because of Hamas. Proportionality is a big one. What is proportionality? I And, and this is something you need to say to somebody. So would it be proportionate for us to now fire 7,000 rockets into Gaza indiscriminately, hitting cities? 
right? Where way more people would have died had we done something like that, right? As opposed to our targeted bombings that we do against Hamas installations. Would it be proportionate for us to now send in a bunch of Israelis to go kidnap, rape, and murder women and children? And guess what? There's not going to be one Israeli soldier who's going to volunteer for a job like that. And so, no, that's not what proportionality is. Proportionality is, is you were attacked. You need to eliminate that threat. And by when you eliminate that threat, how much collateral damage is caused? And do the, do the gains outweigh the drawbacks, the collateral damage? That's proportionality under international law. Death counts don't tell us anything about proportionality. Showing a, 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 a chart, which has been spread now by the New York Times and others, which starts very strategically in 2008, which is such a slap in the face to all of us who lived through the Second Intifada and watched over a, a, thousand, a thousand Israelis murdered between 2000 and 2005. But that chart doesn't tell you the whole story. And this is what I would say, if you're a British person, this is what I would say to somebody who brings up proportionality. I would say, okay, I'm going to show you a chart of innocent Brits who died in World War II, right? In the Blitz bombing of London and Manchester and Coventry. And then I'm going to show you how many Germans died in the Blitz bombing, in the, in the fire bombing of Dresden, which was the British and the Americans retaliation on the Germans. And what you will see is that more innocent Germans died in Dresden than British people died in the fire bombing of London, in the Blitz bombing of London. And yet, does that mean that the Brits were the oppressor of World War II? That y'all were the aggressor of World War II? Say that to a British person. Make them realize that numbers don't tell you the whole story. And that when you're trying to root out evil, which is what Hamas is, they demonstrated this so clearly to us. If you're capable of cutting off the head of a baby, if you're capable of burning families alive, if you're capable of setting a house on fire, knowing that somebody is inside, and then you sit outside and you wait until they run out and you shoot them dead, you might as well be a Nazi. And so we are weeding out evil. And no one would have questioned us. If in, well, they would have, now they wouldn't, knowing the hindsight, now, now that we have hindsight, but I'm going to make a comparison and it's not going to be an easy one to hear, but I think it's important. You know, a lot of people have been making 9-11 comparisons. It's not the right comparison. A lot of people are making ISIS comparisons. It's almost a good, a good comparison. The right comparison is this is a comparison to the Holocaust, but not the Holocaust that we think of, not the Holocaust of, of gas chambers and death camps and cattle cars. It's the Holocaust by bullets, the Holocaust that happened until the Vansi conference, until they decided the way in which they were going to exterminate the Jews. And the first step, what they did was not the gas chambers. It was sending terror squads, the Einsatzgruppen, into Poland and into Ukraine and into the other Soviet controlled territories and going door to door and killing Jews. This is the same. And the same way that if Israel had existed in 1940, again, before Vansi, before the first gas chamber, if Israel had existed in 1940, when those terror squads were going village to village, murdering Jews, they would have gone into Germany and they would have bombed Germany. And innocent Germans would have died in the process because the Nazis were also embedded in cities and no one would have batted an eye knowing what was coming. But now we have the hindsight to know what might be coming. Hamas has stated their goals very clearly. It's in their charter. Their goal is the obliteration of the state of Israel. That is their goal. Their obliteration of Israel and a wiping out of the Jews, that they will murder every last Jew on this planet. And you know what we've learned? We've learned that when somebody tells you that they want to wipe you out, you believe them. And not only when they tell you, but now they've acted on it. They've been telling it to us since 1987 when they were founded. Now they've committed the worst massacre against Jews since the Holocaust. And Israel is not taking any chances. We're not gonna wait. We're not gonna sit back. We live in a world now where Jews can defend themselves. And don't apologize for it, don't. So what can we do? What can we really do? Because the denial is already out there, which is a core feature of genocide, right? Which is essentially the intentions of, of Hamas. The denial is already there. So what can we do? Share stories. Do not let the world forget why this happened. Do not let the world forget the photos and the images of those families that are held hostage, the people who have been killed. My friend's harrowing story of having to crawl on his arms and legs, on his, on his hands and knees, literally trying to avoid gunfire that's going over his head as he's crawling through a field trying to protect himself while he leaves people behind saying, come, come. And he now knows that they've been murdered behind him. Tell these stories. I want everyone watching this call 
I want every single one of you to, after this call, hang up and go read one story of, of somebody who was murdered or somebody who was kidnapped. I want you to know the story through and through. I want you to know their name and I want you to know their age and I want you to know how it all played out. I want you to know the last text message that they sent or the last phone call that they made. And I need you to share their story because people have already forgotten and it's been 10 days and they've forgotten when Hamas really GoPro'd their massacre. I mean, the denial is remarkable. Holocaust, we didn't have all these images necessarily. It wasn't being blasted on social media. And here we are in an age where it is, and there's still denial. So you need to keep telling these stories. Keep spreading those images, because what's going to take over on social media are the images coming out of Gaza. And we have to go back. And so go back to the Stand With Us page, scroll down, and just repost one of those stories that's up there. Learn a story yourself. Go to your to your peers when you're having conversations. And when they say, what about Gaza? You say, let me tell you a story. And you tell them one of those stories. And you help them understand that this didn't come out of nowhere. That we're doing this for a reason. We're doing this to weed out evil. I'm going to wrap up. And I just want to say there's so much more to talk about. So there is a there is a amazing resource for you. It's standwithus.com slash situation room. It is a site that we are updating consistently with information Charlotte. so that you can have the facts. Yes. Charlotte, thank you so much for covering so much ground um, so quickly. There is... I time and since you really covered a lot of ground you're extraordinary um one of the kind of most asked questions that we've been asked is how do we explain the loss of civilian life in gaza to non-jews how do we what's the best way to explain that so for really, you have to explain Hamas. You have to explain that this is a terrorist organization that has spent the last 16 years embedding their terror infrastructure within civilian populations. So they have to understand that when they see a building taken down in Gaza, that that building is not just an apartment building housed by, by normal residents. It might be, but one of those floors might be controlled by Hamas and it might have ammunition in it. It might have, it might be one of their war rooms. It might be a building where on top they have a, a tower that's meant to disrupt Israeli communication. There are so many many. They, they've, and then there's the tunnel network underneath Gaza that's been dug by Hamas. And so when people say, where can the civilians go? The funny part is, well, there's actually a shelter underneath Gaza that they could go to. Hamas just doesn't allow them into it. So innocent civilian casualties are happening because we are fighting not on a battlefield, but we are forced to fight in cities because that is where the battle is being, that where we are being drawn into. We wish we could fight Hamas on a battlefield. We wish Hamas were not the cowards that they are who murder innocent women and children, but actually wanted to come face to face with an army. Because if they marched towards Israel and we were fighting a war the way that we fought a war in the past, then we would know exactly who's innocent and who's not. But they don't. They don't wear uniforms and they don't fight on a battlefield. They fight in cities. And every single one of those people should be asking themselves, why are we fighting in a city? Why? Who drew us into that city? Did we choose that? Because we have army bases in Israel. And if we were going to fight, we would be fighting there not in our cities. So you have to you have to pose that question back to people and say, why are we fighting in cities? Because that's where Hamas wants us to fight. Because they want innocent people dead. And you can then show them the many videos, by the way, that are available online that show Hamas admitting that they use human shields and that they're proud of using human shields, that those human shields are martyrs to them. And they have no qualms losing their own civilians. They talk about it. Our, our value is that we love death. The, the, the failure, the, the challenge of the Israelis is that they love life so much. They say this. The, there are videos that you can pull that demonstrate this. So that's what we need to be explaining. Thank you, Charlotte. And one final question. How many Palestinians support Hamas? That is a very hard question to answer. Um, unfortunately, I mean, polls have shown that it's actually more significant than one would think. Um, the, also the question though, is then why I think that's a really big one. Um, you know, we have to understand that if you are one of the 1 million people who have been raised in Gaza over the last 20 years, because that's how much the population has grown, it's basically doubled. You have only born, been raised into a world with Hamas propaganda, with Hamas education. And so you don't know any better. 
And it's like saying how many Germans supported the Nazis, right? Well, all the Nazi youth, youth did because they were brainwashed from the beginning to support it, right? And so it's a very difficult question to answer. Who's supporting it? Who can't speak out against it, right? So we have both. We have people in Gaza who've been protesting just lately saying, you know, Hamas, you brought this on us. Hamas, why are you doing this to us? But then you have those who are incredibly supportive of Hamas. And so it's a very hard question to answer. Um, and that's and I know that that's being asked because when we think of the casualty counts, we think, well, how many of these people are, are supporters of Hamas? You know, I look at a child on a casualty list and I want to think, well, it's just a child. But I'm sitting there thinking, but if you're a child, of a Hamas member and you died because we killed a Hamas commander in his house and we took out his wife and his children, with all due respect, I don't think that I would feel sympathy for a Nazi leader if his child was killed with him. And I know that might sound really heartless, but this is the horrible reality that we've been shoved into. And so we have to remember that those numbers, women, children, well, that woman could be a Hamas terrorist wife. She is as complicit, as far as I'm concerned, as her husband is, right? And these are all things that I think the Western world really struggles with because we see women and children as innocent people, unless they're Israelis, which obviously then we don't care if they're slaughtered and murdered. They're just part of the occupation, according to many. But anyone else, women and children are off limits. And I think we need to reconsider that because a guy, a, a kid who's 15 years old, who's been given a gun by Hamas is no longer an innocent civilian. He's now a terrorist who's trying to kill me. And these are all challenges because the Western world can't even comprehend the notion of martyrdom, the notion that mothers in Gaza are saying, yeah, I had six kids so I can sacrifice three of them to the, to the resistance. This is something that, again, the Western world is not used to. And so when you do show this to people, the one, my final message is really remember that you're breaking down barriers for people. And they believe something and they want to believe it. And so you're coming in and telling them something different. And I want you to think about the last time somebody maybe proved you wrong or wanted to show you something that you were resistant to. You got to go slow. You got to massage it into them. You got to be patient with them. You got to trickle in information. Don't send giant paragraphs. Send a video. Say, this is a mother saying she wants her child to die, right? This is a, a woman who's acknowledging her acceptance of Hamas, her support of Hamas. These are things that we have to understand. They're different. This isn't the Western world. This is the, the wild, wild West, the wild, wild East, if you will. And it's different. And so these are all things that we need to be putting out there to help people understand. And again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be expressing sympathy. I don't want innocent people to die in Gaza. I just don't. I wish there was another option. I don't know what that other option is anymore. Hamas has backed us into a corner. And now we have to protect ourselves from a, a genuine threat that has now caused the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us and for being so open and so informative. And um, just know that the a, a recording of tonight will be distributed with all of the suggested um, links, resources, and um, and anything, any other information that you may need. Charlotte, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I've also put my my Instagram handle in the chat and my email or, or the website and I'll put my email as well. So if anyone wants to continue to ask any questions, if there's anything I didn't address and you need assistance with, please, please be in touch. Stand With Us is there for you. Stand With Us UK is there for you. So if you need us, just genuinely just shoot, shoot us a quick message and we are happy to help. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and the best of luck. Keep on doing what you're doing.